I got to ask your thoughts on what's happening with Netflix. It's almost like the pandemic never happened and all of that demand for content just sort of evaporated. What's your take here? Well, look, Netflix is a very, very profitable company now, and they are um, as healthy as, as they've ever been. I think the market probably got ahead of itself in valuation. It's really a valuation move. I think the uh, expectation for substantial growth over a very, very long term was built into their stock price. And I think it's the growth is going to be a little bit more moderate. And I think that you know, pop the balloon a little bit. It doesn't mean Netflix is not a healthy company. It doesn't mean it's not a, a great product. And the, uh, the, the content that they make is not only prolific and have you know, high volume, a lot of it's very, very good too. So I just see that as a valuation move, not, not an indictment of the business model of the company at all. Now, you last told me you always looked at this as, as you know, there will be a handful of global players, but there will remain some smaller niche players, you know, now that you see what's happened, especially over the last year, do you still expect consolidation? And if so, what core services stand out and survive? Yeah, I do expect consolidation. I think I think the Netflix um, news and the stock price movement is uh, it kind of confirms that thesis, actually, more than anything else. I think when you have when you're spending that kind of money at Netflix and Disney and Amazon, um, HBO Max, they, there's a lot of money spent on content. And when there is now an apparent, you know, there is a ceiling to how many subscribers uh, are going to um, join, join the club, as it were. I think that does mean that there will be, you know, it does cause consolidation. Um, there will be a, uh, a, a small universe of truly global platforms that can spend 10 plus billion dollars a year on content and do so profitably. And I think that is probably four or five services at the most. Um, again, my thesis, uh, I maintain my thesis of smaller niche programming services uh, continuing to do very well and, and becoming profitable, but, but smaller. And so the expense, um, the expenses that they're willing to make or can make and the investments in content will be commensurately smaller as well. But I don't know, four or five big global services, that's probably about it. So kind of ask then where you'd put your money. Is it Netflix? Is it your alma mater, Disney? Is it HBO as we near the close of, you know, the Warner Media uh, Discovery merger and why? Yeah, well, look, Netflix has a huge lead and there's a bit of a flywheel effect too. The more subscribers you have and the more ARPU, the more revenue you get from those subscribers, the more money you have at your disposal to invest in content. And then you can, the flywheel turns and you can you know, attract more customers because your content base is that much bigger. So there's definitely a flywheel effect and a positive feedback loop, if you will. Netflix is at the top of that. Um, there's no way to dislodge them, I don't think, reasonably. Um, and I think they're, they're, they're in a great position, notwithstanding the recent um, you know, de you know, decline in their stock price, as we had just discussed. Disney is, has too many, um, too many assets, too many brands. Their programming is great. Their creative, their creativity at Disney is second to none. Um, and they have a similar flywheel. And they have, they have other businesses to make money from as well, which can feed into that entire uh, ecosystem to afford more content and invest in great content. So I see Disney as a big winner also, for sure. Um, HBO Max, they have a huge library. They have, uh, they, they have a lot of creative executives that do great work. So I, I, I figure they're going to be a big winner too. And then you have Apple TV Plus, all the money in the world. Um, they're building a good team. I know Zach Van Amberg pretty well. He's a, he's a very substantially um, um, quality creative executive. And I think they're in it for the long haul. So I, I, I see that, um, that them being a survivor or a winner, I would say, and Amazon also. Um, you get to some of the other services and maybe one or two of them can survive in, with their big global aspirations. And either they'll have to combine and consolidate or reduce their aspirations to be something more of a niche, either territorially a niche or by genre. Well, speaking of reducing or sort of changing aspirations, given your role at Disney and, and ESPN, do you think Disney might ever spin off ESPN at this point? It's always a possibility. If you think about Disney, they have theme parks based on all that Disney IP, Disney, Marvel, Star Wars, National Geographic, and Pixar. They have channels around the world, which are actually collapsing now into their streaming service. And they have consumer products that are based on those, um, on those uh, properties as well. And that forms an ecosystem that's very definable and very, uh, and very um, robust and I think has a great future. ESPN is different. Now, ESPN was strategic to Disney for a long time because it helped them sell their channel bundle in the US um, in a more robust, more profitable way. Um, it's still a great business. I know Jimmy Pitaro very well, who runs it. He's an incredibly capable executive. 
think the business is good. It's going to have to transition to be an over-the-top service uh, over the next several years, I think. And then you have the question, is there a strategic coupling between all the other brands that Disney has and ESPN? I think it's a little weaker than it once was when, when again, ESPN was used to carry the carriage of ABC and Disney Channel and FX. It was, it's quite valuable in that realm. But when channels become a little less important to Disney, um, that could be seen somewhat, somewhat differently. I do think, however, the bundle that I put in place actually and still, still is in place between ESPN and Disney Plus and Hulu is quite valuable. So in terms of a rebundling approach, having ESPN as a sports over the top service still provides some strategic advantage. So I think it could go, it could go either way, really. Okay, now you've been making a lot of deals meantime, buying Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine, uh, a minority stake in Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith's Westbrook company. You're adding Faraway Production. How are all the companies you bought going to work together, and where is this going? Well, look, we're a big believer in the future of media configured for the creator economy and the, intent, the attention economy. So what do I mean by that? We like traditional film and TV uh, businesses because... They sell to streamers, and this, as we just talked about, the demand for content from these global and territorially local um, streaming players is growing strong double digits. I don't see that stopping anytime soon. So I think there's a strong demand for film and television product. And if you think about Reese Witherspoon's company, which is a fantastic company, they make their, their center of gravity is film and television. If you think about, and they also have social media and they have um, social commerce opportunities associated with it. Um, our company, we want to be in the film and TV business, but we also want to be in the social storytelling business. And when you, one thing I noticed when I was at TikTok, however briefly, was that if you can have an authentic connection between a brand and a creator and a social media audience, there are very substantial commerce opportunities that arise from that. So we'd like to be in all those portions of that, you know, content um, community, which is social media storytelling and the associated e-commerce potential. And if you think about, look at Moonbug, another company we bought, that, that is a kid's intellectual property owner. Uh, they own Coco Melon, they own Blippi, they own Morphles, they own some of the more modern intellectual property for kids. And all of that comes from YouTube. So they start off as social media storytellers, and then they've taken that and repackaged it and sold it to Netflix. By the way, Coco Melon was the number two streamed show on Netflix for 2021, and just a smidgen behind Criminal Minds. So this stuff really works, and that's you know, that, that, that company was based on social media storytelling, and then all, all of that will end up having um, social commerce opportunities. So we like that configuration of our company. We like having intellectual property um, being delivered to audience where those eyeballs are, and more and more they're moving to social media platforms. Since you mentioned YouTube, and by the way, lots of Coco Melon watching happening in my house, um, I recently Sorry sat down that. with YouTube, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki, and we talked about the creator economy and her outlook. Take a quick listen to what she had to say. We actually saw a 35% increase in the number of creators that are generating um, six-figure income out of YouTube. Um, and in the last year. And so that's just an example of like how the creator economy is continuing to grow. How do you see the creator economy really unfolding? Obviously, you know, there are big established creators, then there are these smaller players all across YouTube, and there's so much competition and demand for their time. Um, and, and it's also a different kind of content. It is very much a different kind of content. I mean, if you look at film and television, that's 22 minutes at the minimum, up to, you know, a couple hours for a, for a, for a film. Um, so those are, those are pretty long form. YouTube is in the middle. You know, they're usually around, I don't know, four to 10 minute, you know, length um, storytelling. That's where we are with, um, with Moonbug and Coco Melon. And we think that's a, that is a different form of storytelling. Although, by the way, you can take those four to six to 10 minute um, clips, put them together and make a traditional media um, length, a, a full length um, TV show. And we did that with Coco Melon and that's what you see on Netflix, for instance. Um, and then you get down to the very, very short stuff, the very short videos, you know, less than 60 seconds on, uh, on um, TikTok, and that takes a, in, an extremely different muscle. So I think you do have to have a storytelling capability that reaches across all of those lengths, if you will, of, of film. And then there's pod, podcasts as well, which is just audio, it takes a different form of storytelling altogether. So I think that you that we're going to have a coexistence of all of these different lengths of video, if you will, from traditional down to very, very short um, videos. And then marketing messages are also getting shorter. I think that you know, some of these five to six sec second ads that are in front of YouTube videos are pretty effective. And that takes a different mm. type of creative approach also. 
So it is about telling stories in different formats in different ways. And by the way, the difference between a, you know, a landscape or horizontal uh, video and a vertical video, even that makes a big difference. Right. Um, so you do have to understand how to tell stories in each of these ways. And I think that's why Candle Media, that company I'm growing with Tom Staggs and Blackstone and Reese and, and the others is, um, we're, we're, we're building it with that in mind. So we I actually have, a, I think a pretty modern approach uh, to how we're going to get entertainment content in front of people.